and welcome to our broadcast this morning, Facebook comrades and YouTube comrades and everybody who sees this in any venue. We're happy to have you, Rosanna, Michael, Anita, and Scott. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Good morning Revolution. Revolution. Well, um, it is a bright, beautiful morning here in New York City. Um, and uh, but that doesn't stop the homeless crisis. Uh, and it doesn't stop a bad jobs report. Uh, 194,000 only. 194,000. They said it was going to be 500. This morning, I that was the pre projection, but it was, you know, not even close, not even half of that. Um, and uh, Rosanna, the economy is continuing to sputter, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I'm wondering if they're supposed to have expected the growth because the end of the, uh, the federal stimulus and all these other things. So I don't know. I'm not sure why. But yeah. They say people don't want to go back to work, Scott. Well, I think a lot of people... A lot of people can't go back to work, right? Because um, schools are still not, you know, fully and reliably open. There are a lot of outbreaks, uh, closures, um, and uh, you know, it's, so it's not just wanting to go back to work. It's the the concrete possibility. And the other thing is that you know, when the when these wage uh, increases started happening because um, employers were there was a so-called labor shortage or or whatever. Uh, companies started bumping up their wages. Um, I think a lot of people interpreted that as, wow, you know, this is like, finally workers are in a position of power and our, you know, wages are going up and whatever. And, you know, workers' power doesn't come from the market. It comes from organization. Um, and so the, those, those gains um, in, in wages are, are, I think, now being offset by um, you know, reluctance to hire on the part of employers and, and um, increasing overwork of uh, employees that are uh, that are employed. I mean, what Wait a minute now, I, I, I just read this idea, Scott, that wages are rising, according to some of the bourgeois economists, and plus you got the child tax credit in your pocket, and they said that people are that that feeling comfortable. I actually read that. Yeah. <laughs> They're feeling comfortable and it strengthens the position of labor. You don't agree with that? Uh, I think what strengthens the position of labor is organizing and um, we're seeing a lot of that. You know, the, the strike wave that you've talked about before is, um, is ongoing, um, but Yes, I mean we should we should be clear, especially the 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 extension of the supplemental unemployment uh, benefits in the first round of COVID relief under Biden. That was that was huge, and it did um, put pressure on employers to raise wages. Um, but without, I mean, again, the the power of workers doesn't come from from market forces. It comes from how you know, how organized we are. But there are objective factors, Anita, that, that are influencing in the economy, whether or not people want to go back to work. I mean, I had a guy tell me the other day in Northeast Ohio, they got a big sign outside of a furniture uh, factory. He said, we'll give you a $1,500 bonus if you come back to work. I mean, what do you think? And then starvation wages after that. Um, no, you know, it's I mean, fifteen dollars an hour. Okay, okay. Well, you know, I'm glad they're. I'm glad the the, the floor is working starvation wages, but not in a youngstown or warm. <laughs> but the but well, the counter side to that is they're also at least here in New well, York they're paying they're paying a hundred dollars to anyone who gets the vaccine. Anita, so you're you're the DO of Ohio. What are you saying to the working class? Well, I, I mean, I think there. I think we desperately need the Biden's uh, um, jobs bill. He doesn't call it the job, or they don't call it the jobs bill anymore. 
But um, but that bill that that has the child care subsidies and the um the uh, the wages for uh, the caring economy, elder care and child care, family leave act, all of these things and child care subsidies. I mean, the 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 uh, pandemic um, recession really hit women hard, and they still have not come back to the economy. Um, they can't get child care to um, that are that's reliable. And sometimes, as Scott said, their their kids get sent home for you know two weeks because of uh, COVID outbreaks. Um, so I think the the the, the anti vaxxers and the anti maskers are are delaying uh, that that process. But I think think also we need an infusion of uh, federal support for those kind of jobs programs. And I think that would be really the the way our economy could turn around a little bit. And Given man, that we don't have a planned economy, of course, that would be even better. Man, Manjin is calling it an entitlement. You, you're trying to create an entitlement society, Michael. And we don't need an entitlement society. We need a caring society. You agree with that? Well, I didn't hear that quote from Manchin. I was more disturbed by Lindsey Graham, who did get the vaccine, you know, Republican senator from... Um, South Carolina, he was addressing some of his constituents uh, a few days ago. And when he suggested that they think about the vaccine, just think about it, that he was booed off to say, boo, we don't. And so <laughs> what kind of society is that? You know, that's, a, that's an, un, I, I think we need a society that um, cares for one another. We have to care for one another. And, you know, part of us being communists is that we're, 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 we're selfless in that sense. You know, we, maybe we don't like getting a needle in the arm, but we have to, you know, all get vaccinated to stop this virus. And, you know, in order for us to get back to work and for us to, you know, uh, go back to normal, um, like we were before the pandemic, we're going to have to suck it up and get this vaccine. And so, you know, in, in terms of mansion, who doesn't get the job done holding all this up, um, in terms of these people, like uh, Anita was saying, anti-vaxxers, the, you know, people who refuse to believe in science and, and, uh, debate all these uh, conspiracy theories. It's not helping anyone. It affects them negatively as well. Well, I think you and Rosanna are right that the uh, issue of the vaccine and COVID is a big thing. Everybody spoke to this, by the way, keeping people away from some, you know, participating and uh, going back to work and all of that. And the quickest way to end that is to pull your arm up Pull your, roll your sleeve up, get the goddamn vaccine, stop messing around. You're gonna cause, but the rate, how is it in California? Are the rates going down, Rosanna? I mean, are the COVID deaths, I hope so. Yeah, it's going down considerably. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think we had uh, 10 deaths that were reported, which is the really low, 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 low number. But you know, in California and in, in Los Angeles, where I live, we have, they've just implemented, in fact, it goes into effect today, very strict laws that even if you go to a bar, if you're going anywhere, uh, you need to have proof of vaccine. So if you're going into the amusement parks, uh, all of those kinds of things, uh, you have to have either a negative COVID test 72 hours before it, or you have to have proof of your vaccination in order to get into some of these, in many of these venues, in pretty much everything. It's very, very strict. Uh, they're very serious about, you know, curving this. Too many people have died, really. You know, too many people have died to just think of yourself. Has anybody been following what's going on in the, uh, with respect to the new report by the Senate Judiciary Committee, they say they detail how Trump and them are trying to strong arm the Justice Department to overturn the election. I mean, no. surprise anybody? No, I, I, just, I just saw that his attorney, one of his attorneys who resigned uh, in Georgia, I think, um, he said that, you know, he didn't know, he didn't understand why. But Trump, during during those 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 final days of, of the uh, of his um, administration, was obsessed with Georgia. He really, really thought that um, he could have never lost in Georgia. So he was he was convinced it wasn't just him, you know, carrying on and on. He was really convinced by his own conspiracy theory 
and um, you know the people that were per perpetuating them. And I think that's dangerous because there was kind of remember I don't know if, if you all remember, but the the uh, mainstream media was really trying to disconnect um, what Trump did. I guess the conservative media, what what Trump said in that speech when he said let's march on the Capitol from like the the kind of QAnon and uh, an all right planning that took that took uh, place before. Um, they stormed the Capitol. It was, oh no, it was, it wasn't related, but you know, if he truly believed that, and he wasn't just being a sore loser, that he could have never possibly lost in a Southern state like Georgia, you know, that's pretty dangerous because that means that, you know, there was in fact a coup that he was planning and, um, you know, fortunate for us, you know, the institutions kind of, uh, in place, uh, prevented that from happening. Um, but it just goes to show that we're, we're not out of this yet. We're finding out more and more. Um, as time goes on and as people, you know, begin to step forward and we're finding documents and conversations that are surfacing now. And um, as I understand it, you know, Biden's approval ratings are dropping and Trump's are, are, are going up, you know, more people. I don't think it's quite 50 percent yet. I think the latest number I saw was 44 percent. But there's already Trump 2024 flags that you can see flying around. And so that's a dangerous um, that's a dangerous mentality that we're dealing with. Well, you know, the uh, big issue, though, is that they are still making plans. I saw Steve Bannon is calling for 20,000 shock troops to dismantle the administrative state once Trump is reelected. He said, we own this country, Anita, mm -hmm. and we need to start acting like it. Does he own Ohio? Uh, we have to be so vigilant of this uh, of this trend, and I think I, I'm sure there are folks in Ohio who would really support that too. But um, you know, yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I'd like to think that he was defeated one time and he could get defeated again. But I know there are rules in place, there are voter suppression laws in place that will just make stealing the next election easier uh, than it was for him to have stolen this one. So uh, yeah, I think we're in a really dangerous place and we have to keep fighting against uh, the fascist danger, just like we said in 2020. I think we, we have, have the, I think we have the numbers, you know, I think uh, if we, if even if with all of these things in place, those of us that can go out and vote, that can drive, that can, you know, withstand standing in line for six hours or whatever, we're the ones who need to step up at this point in time. A massive, massive, massive voter turnout can can really help in in preventing this takeover. So I think that you know, and, and education of the workers into the process and all of that uh, is also necessary, and we should be preparing for that. So there's some elections coming up in Virginia, right, and in, uh, uh, in New York City, and in Buffalo is it a mayor. When is the election uh, in Pennsylvania, Scott? I think for yeah, it's uh, it's coming up soon. I'm in New York, but um, it's you right on the border, right? You, yeah, you're a border straggler. You should <laughs> vote. Look, looking places. forward to. I, God, I hope uh, John Fetterman wins the Senate race in in Pennsylvania. Um, and when is the election shot, in but... Ohio, Anita? Well, uh, November 2nd, but we have uh, in my own district where I live, we have Allison Russo, uh, a Democrat running against Mike Casey, I think his name is. Mike Casey is a Trump Republican who, um, you know, it's an, it's an open seat. The, uh, the incumbent resigned. Um, and Mike Casey is a formal, former coal lobbyist and all really tied up in some really shady stuff in, in West Virginia. And he's running, it's a, it's a gerrymandered Republican district, uh, but we're trying our best. We're getting, getting people out on the street to try to, try to defeat uh, Mike Casey because we don't want him in, in Congress, definitely. Well, the right wing wins again. We're going to have to take our billions of dollars that we have located offshore. What's the name of that new scandal that they have? Pandora Papers. Pandora Papers. And... Uh, uh, we can go to Switzerland, live up in the Alps or the Chateau, uh, Scott, and drink brandy and ski and smoke cocaine and you know and that that scandal that, that scandal is not isolated from the fascist danger either. They found you know three right wing uh, candidates or I guess uh, politicians in Latin America. The president of recently elected president of Ecuador, 
the right wing, almost like Pinochet, like dictator Piñera right now in Chile and, and the Dominican president, uh, uh, Abinader, they're all related to that scandal as well. And so I don't know, I think, and then going back to talking about the elections, I, again, I, I don't think people should, they were warning people on uh, Spanish language news television uh, the other day, Telemundo, Univision, they were saying, you know, don't think that the Republicans can't win in New York. You know, we have Adams, you know, former Republican, African-American, former police officer running as a Democratic candidate. And the right wing candidate, I forget his name, it's slipping me right now, looks so ridiculous wearing his like red beret, almost, you know, like a fascist. But we've had two Republicans in recent history be the mayor of New York. You know, um, we had Bloomberg, we had Giuliani, and then, you know, Cuomo stepped down. Um, and so, you know, there's going to be the, the governor race as well. And so there's just you can't just take things for granted and say, oh, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. Um, the struggle continues. Well, I, I want to get back to this question of the, the report from the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, for a sec, because it, it seems like, you know, since the beginning of Trump's presidency, there's been this um, continual uh, stream of reports of all kinds of the shadiest and most criminal behavior, um, with the, the Mueller report being the, you know, the most prominent example. And what happened with the Mueller report seems to be like a kind of paradigm for the rest of it, where you have this report with, oh yeah, we have all this, but we're not going to charge anybody, right? We're not going to actually, um, you know, prosecute. Um, and there seems to be this sort of, it seems like they're the investigations, they're hoping they work as like a propaganda campaign. If we just like make people aware of how shady all of this was, they'll, but that's not, that's not what the government needs to do at this point. If these institutions, as Michael said, are, are going to play some role in, in preventing the fascist danger, it needs to be more than, than just, you know, threats of resignations or, you know, um, revelations of shady behavior. It needs to be actual, you know, I'm, you know, not, it, it feels weird as a communist to be saying, you know, bring the hammer down, uh, state power, uh, whatever, in a, in a capitalist state. But um, I, I think we should be demanding a much more aggressive uh, investigation and prosecution of uh, Trump and his cronies and the entire January 6th affair. Um, yeah, I heard one of the talking heads this morning say exactly what you're saying, Scott, that they need to open up a, an investigation in the uh, Justice Department with respect to their uh, ob obstruction of justice and attempts to overturn the election. Stop playing around with it. That's one part of it. And then the other part of it is that they're uh, trying to, they issue subpoenas. This uh, committee, what's it called? The Select Committee on January the 6th to uh, Bannon and three or four others. And Trump told them, ignore it. Don't <laughs> comply. And the issue is how serious is the Select Committee and the Justice Department and Congress to enforce those subpoenas? Are they going to put them in jail if they don't show up or are they just using it for propagandistic uh, purposes? But here's the thing in my opinion, all of that taken into consideration, if you don't have movements on the ground, if people are not protesting in big numbers, pushing, 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 all that stuff taking place on the top it's just going to take place on the top. They're going to make deals. They're going to make compromises. Not the compromises. Okay, you know, you have to make compromises in life, you know. But the protests matter. That's my slogan of the week, Rosanna. Protests matter. And uh, we were out there on the weekend, by the way, uh, for the women's marches in D.C. Scott, mm -hmm. we had... Uh, in New York City, in Columbus, in Houston, you know, party was out there, public, and uh, and uh, we're gonna stay out there um, uh, until justice is done, which is 
that's going to be a long time, 500 years. I'll be dead and gone at that point. But anyway, I'm going to raise up the younger people to take to, to take our place. Uh, we, Michael, do we have any programs coming up? Um, we have one on the 17th, a deep organizing um, a workshop. You can go to cpusa.org and sign up for that. Um, and then towards the end of the month, I believe it's the 24th, we're going to have a class on rural communities, how to organize rural workers um, who live in you know, Republican controlled districts and some of them may be influenced by some of Trump's backwards ideas. We, you know, we can't give up on that section of the working class. And so comrade Tim Wheeler is gonna lead uh, the discussion on that topic. All right, and then the Labor Commission is having a conference on uh, the working class and different trends. If you're interested, write to us at cpusa at cpusa.org and uh, we, can, uh, we can hook you up. But our movement is growing. Did y'all see that picture of Grimes reading the manifesto? She's and, not a party uh, member. We have to be clear. People, oh, she's a party member. <laughs> we had to make that clear, just like not when yet. CNN. Yeah, when CNN. We got some uh, criticisms for it. They, they, they said, oh, this is bourgeois. But if she were to join the Communist Party, wouldn't we welcome her? I mean, yeah, anyone willing course. to pick up the, the worker struggle should be welcome, you know, and, you know, we've had, we've had singers be in the party. She's a singer. We've had singers be in the party before Paul Robeson, you know, we have turned him away because he's a singer who has a little bit more money than the average. Oh, you know. we had singers, actors, musicians, composers, artists of all different, and we still do, you know. My but thing, I think, my that thing the, is, is, I think that the issue is that she's rich and that she was dating Elon Musk and uh, everybody hates him, correctly so. Uh, but everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> everybody makes mistakes, it's true. The thing is, is that she reading that, well, she wasn't reading, she posed, she posed with a picture of it. She said, I'm not a communist, um, but I agree with, you know, universal basic income or, you know, whatever. But the point is, is that during the 1950s, we had comrades or people even just uh, closely associated progressive people in Hollywood were arrested for even, um, you know, holding progressive ideas. So imagine what would have happened had they, you know, posted a picture of reading the manifesto. That's what this is about. Well, you know, I, I don't think I don't think anyone expects Grimes to build the Communist Party or whatever, but she's encouraging people to read Marx and, you know, people who hadn't heard about Marx before and they're in the grocery store and they pick up the tabloid, they say, oh, maybe I should, you know, check that out. More power to them. It's double-edged, right. like everything under capitalism, right? Because there's this sense where the ruling class wants to co-opt, right? They want to um, make a spectacle of revolutionary and, pro and even progressive politics and sort of defang it, right? So, but on the one hand, you know, it's, it's part of that. And it's not, not, I'm not saying that Grimes personally has that tactic in mind, but the ruling class as a whole does that with revolutionary ideas. But that's also, like I said, double-edged because it, as Michael was saying, it exposes our ideas more. So what determines which side it falls on, who, who benefits? And it's like Joe and, and Rosanna and everybody on the show always says, it's the strength of the movement, it's the organization, the political development of the mass working class movement, the, our success in the ideological struggle that's gonna determine whether Grimes posing with the communist manifesto is going to increase class consciousness and revolutionary uh, thinking or whether it's going to, you know, co-opt and defang. Um, it's not automatically that as soon as a rich person holds the manifesto, uh, you know, it's automatically uh, been co-opted or whatever. And you have the last word. Until next week, comrades and friends, brothers and sisters, stay strong, stay safe, and stay in the fight. Have a great Bye, weekend. Bye, everyone. Morning revolution.